Hi, and welcome back to Spectral Methods in Machine Learning. Today we're going to be talking about kernel approximation. So if you remember from last time, uh, Gaussian processes have order n cubed computational complexity, where n is the number of data points that we're attempting to train on. So this can be quite a computational bottleneck if our data um, set is very large. So random Fourier features, or RFFs, are a way of alleviating this issue. RFFs um, map the data to randomized low dimensional feature spaces. And once we've done that, we can apply fast linear models on top of them. So this method uses RFFs to construct an approximation of the kernel that is structured in such a way that fast linear methods apply. If you remember from last time, Bochner's theorem tells us that every stationary, stationary kernel, uh, which again means that the kernel is just a function of the difference between the location of the two uh, data points, is characterized by its Fourier transform that we call the power spectral density. So the power spectral den density is a uh, non-negative and it's integrable. So we can associate a probability density to it. So if we integrate the power spectral density, um, in this case, we call that Z, the normalizing constant, or K of zero. And if we were to divide by this constant, then we get a uh, density. We know that um, K of zero holds because integrating the power spectral density yields the power of the process. Um, now I'd like to walk through a little bit of algebra to get the random Fourier feature approximation for the kernel. So if you remember, we have the, that we can characterize the kernel as the Fourier transform um, of the power spectral density written in this way, the top line here. Because we know that um, the power spectral density is symmetric, uh, we know that we get uh, an equivalent kernel by integrating the, the negative of this quantity. And so we can say, well, if I sum these two things together, I get double my integral. So I'll put with this one half in front. And in this way, um, we actually cancel out the complex component of this quantity. And so we can write it only in terms of its cosine. And again, we know that P of W, as we said last time, is a density. So we just rewrite this in terms of a... Uh, expectation, and then using a trigonomic identity, we can write this in terms of cosines and sines. So I'll just toss up the end of that last equation here so we can work with it. Um, and we notice that, again, we've, we've written our kernel as this expectation over a spectral density. And since we have our kernel as an expectation, we can use a, a Monte Carlo a, a approximation of this kernel. So I can rewrite the kernel as this inner product uh, of these functions, which I'll call phi, um, where I define phi to be uh, this, the, the cosine and sine of, of these values. And of course, all my constants cleaned up and put at the front here. So if I were to expand um, this thing transpose times uh, it evaluated at t prime, um, I would recover my uh, a Monte Carlo approximation of my original kernel. So now these features here, which are defined by phi, these are what we call the random Fourier features, or RFF. And we notice essentially we've mapped um, our original observations into this um, space of features uh, and finite dimensional because we've um, cut our uh, Monte Carlo approximation off at, at M. Um, so this is a totally fine way of writing this approximation, and it comes up quite often, but uh, just for posterity, um, and if you're reading um, any of the literature on this, sometimes you'll see an alternate uh, way of expressing this approximation. So I just want to quickly go through that as well. Uh, so using the fact that um, if we integrate um, this cosine quantity from 0 to 2b, regardless of the constant a, we get 0. Uh, and we can do some algebra on this expression. Um, so, you know, the expectation of zero is still zero. Um, and we can write the zero here in terms of this quantity that we have up here. 
uh, inserting W transpose T plus T prime, cleaning everything up, we get this double expectation here, um, expectation of B, um, which amounts to this integral where the density we're talking about is the uniform distribution over zero and two pi. So just keep this in, in mind here that this quantity is equal to zero and we're gonna use it to add it to our previous equation. So let me pop up our pre previous equation here. Here it is. If you ignore this quantity here, which we said is zero, this is our previous equation. Of course, we can add this to it, and then we haven't changed anything. And once we add it to it, we can use, again, another trigonometric identity um, and recover this equation here, which is only written in terms of cosines. So again, uh, same trick. We can take a Monte Carlo approximation of this expectation. This time we only have cosines in here, but of course we have to now sample um, these uh, spectral weights and uh, these constants here, B, which are sampled from the uniform distribution from zero to two pi. So, So using this RFF approximation, uh, or this approximated kernel, significantly simplifies the computation of the posterior distribution of a GP. So it, let's consider some observations corrupted by noise uh, that we want to um, fit with the GP. If you remember from our previous talk, the conditioning formulas for a GP um, tell us that the posterior predictive distribution is also GP. And it's given by these formulas below. Now they're written uh, a little bit differently than you may recognize from the last lecture, but essentially all we've done is we've replaced the kernel with the um, way of writing the kernel according to our feature transformation. So um, if you write this capital um, phi here as being this vector concatenated with all of these features, um, these T's map to this feature space that we're talking about, then we can recover our mean and kernel functions from the posterior GP from those equations, just written in this way. So uh, one interesting thing to note is what we're doing here is we're essentially talking about the Gaussian process um, where the kernel is specified by this approximate kernel. So just going back one slide, um, this kernel that I've specified here, you know, uh, Sorry, to approximate our original kernel is in fact a true kernel. And so we can apply all of our um, predictive posteriors, uh, predictive posterior equations to the GP, which uses this particular kernel here, and here it is. Now, you may be asking, well, what is the savings in doing so? Um, because the real computational bottleneck of a Gaussian process comes when you're trying to invert this matrix here, which has size n by n. And it still has size n by n, where n is the size number of data points you have. So yeah, like I said before, it would still take O n cubed time. But the trick is to um, use an application of, to the, of the matrix inversion lemma to rewrite your equations in terms of these new equations. Now, what you'll notice here is instead of this inner matrix being n by n, it's now m by m, where m is the size of the feature space. So we now have control over um, the computational complexity of our model by um, essentially controlling the dimensionality of the approximation that we want to use. And so this new GP can be computed in O n m squared plus m cubed time. So if you make m significantly smaller than what n is was before, uh, this is quite a savings. And you can see here that you can get a pretty decent approximation for the kernel um, using sample sizes that could be quite a bit smaller than your initial data set. So on the left here, I have a plot of um, squared exponential ARD kernel. Um, the dotted black line is the true kernel. And I have a bunch of approximations using RFFs uh, for different sample sizes. So we have n equals 50, the blue one, uh, the green one is 100, purple is 1,000, and orange is 10,000. Of course, when you get up to 10,000, then you know you may not be um, uh, achieving the same amount of cost savings as you know if your data size is the same size as that. Then there's really no point in doing this. And on the right, I have discrete 
samples from two Gaussian processes, one using the um, SEARD kernel and one using the approximate SEARD kernel. And this is just to demonstrate that indeed you do get a, predict, uh, um, a prior which is you know, relatively similar to the original and you specified. The kernel is, is pretty good at approximating it. So as I mentioned um, a second ago, we can interpret this uh, RFFGP as a model in and of itself. So it's a model where we're specifying the kernel to be the, that inner product. And sure, it's an, it's a, um, it is a approximation of our original kernel, um, but the, the dual way of interpreting that is um, it's in fact its own kernel and we're specifying a new GP by it. And the first formulation of RFFs correspond to assuming that the underlying function is modeled by the following thing. So basically, um, this is the equivalent generative model using an RFF approximation. So it says, well, we're going to use some parameters theta, and uh, we're going to take the inner product with phi transpose. Here's that written out. And so you, you see we actually have a linear model where these weights that i1 uh, and zi2 uh, are multiplied by these cosine and sine features. And these are iid variables drawn from 0, 1, all concatenated to a random vector theta in this case. So I'm um, not going to go through the derivation, but again, if you, if you looked at the, uh, I'm not sure there's anything more to say really, but if you looked at the predictive distribution given by the model that I, linear model I've specified here, you recover the exact predictive distribution of the Gaussian process where you use the kernel, which is defined by phi transpose phi. So, although if we were to sample um, the, like generate these RFF weights by sampling from the um, spectral density, we would get an unbiased estimate of the kernel. Uh, it's not guaranteed that these samples will actually fit the data best. And what I mean by that is if we fix these samples, um, it's, that doesn't guarantee, give, guarantee to give us the best marginal likelihood value for the second interpretation of this model where I'm using this kernel specified by W, I, and B, I. Um, so, well, how can we fix this? Well, if we just think of the W, I's or the W, I's, B, I's as kernel hyperparameters, and then we already talked about the method for fitting kernel hyperparameters, which is to maximize the marginal likelihood. So it's possible to optimize these parameters uh, through optimizing the model evidence. In other words, model evidence is the maximum marginal likelihood. And this may give us a better fit to our data set because we're actually moving around these quote unquote approximate parameters. So the actual method for doing this would be um, initialize your weights by sampling from the spectral densities. And once they've been initialized, then use gradient descent to uh, actually fit the um, these WI parameters that maximize the model evidence. And this method is called the sparse spectrum approximation for GPs, the reference for it here. And I should mention that um, any references that we mention in any of these lectures, the full reference references are avail available in the notes that were provided. One problem of doing this, of course, is we may overfit to the data. Um, that's a common problem with using maximum likelihood estimation for the hyperparameters. Now you can imagine that if inference in a regular GP uh, can get expensive and complicated, then uh, inference in a deep GP uh, is equally difficult. You can imagine that um, if inference in a deep GP Three, two, one. Okay, so um, as mentioned, inference in a deep GP can be very expensive computationally. And so if this is the case, then three, two, one. As discussed, inference in a Gaussian process can be very expensive computationally. 
Um, and so if that's the case, you can imagine that inference uh, in deep Gaussian processes can also be very expensive and difficult. difficult. So generally people turn to approximate methods to do inference in deep Gaussian processes. So um, Kudajar and et al proposed to use random Fourier features to approximate a deep GP with the goal of making inference easier. So if you remember that uh, a deep Gaussian process is just a, a um, composition of many Gaussian processes, one after the other, then we can replace each of these Gaussian processes with an RFF, deep, uh, RFF Gaussian process approximation. So um, basically we have a concatenation or a composition of these um, functions applied to each other. And if we expand these out in terms of the uh, linear formulation for this approximation, we basically get this here. So we basically get um, a uh, inner product of some um, spectral so of our features multiplied by some Gaussian sampled weights. And this is continued on and on and on. So the thing to notice about this formulation is it looks very, very similar to a Bayesian neural net. And in fact, it, it really is a particular formulation of a Bayesian neural net where um, what we do is we take our inputs, uh, we multiply, do linear combination with some, um, with some uh, spectral weights. Uh, we apply our cosine and sine nonlinearities. Uh, we multiply by our sample weights from um, sampled from uh, zero one Gaussian, and then we get our first approximated GP, and this is continued. Um, so in this case, uh, the notation is a little bit different because this uh, figure is taken from the paper, but that's what's going on. And so, as I said, this is a Bayesian neural net with specific architecture. Uh, and independent priors on uh, the second set of weights. Independent zero one Gaussian priors on these weights and spectral density priors on these weights. So um, the authors go on to describe particular architectures where, which correspond to specific kernels. We've done this in general. Um, so, you know, you can, any kernel you want, you can, what we've done so far, you can apply to, but uh, they choose some specific kernels, which make some computation a bit easier, um, in which you can use ReLU activations. That's a particular neural net type of activation. Uh, if you want to check this out any further, we refer you to their paper. So um, if we let, uh, let's call um, phi now the collection of all kernel parameters, uh, w the collection of all angled frequencies, and theta be the collection of all random matrices, then what we've done here is we've collected all of the um, parameters that are in this model together. And once we have all these parameters, as I said, in the Bayesian approach to modeling, um, you know, we've written down our assumptions, we've specified the prior, we've identified all the parameters in our model, and, and we can decide how we want to do inference in these parameters. And we have the choice, you know, a couple of choices are we can you know, um, try and compute a posterior distribution on each of these um, values, on each of these parameters if we want, or we can decide to use a point estimate uh, using maximum likelihood. Now for uh, W and, th and theta, um, we already have priors over this um, because we are just using the um, zero one prior for a theta and the spectral prior for W. Um, but you know, we have to decide what prior uh, we want for phi. This can be a little bit tri tricky because again, to incorporate some of our prior knowledge into this would be a, a bit difficult, but you know, often cases when people have to specify priors like this, they just choose a zero one prior to say like, you know, we want to induce some sort of sparsity. So that's a model consideration that we have to do. Um, and for any, parameters that we want to try and perform posterior inference on, uh, you know, we're going to have to do some sort of approximate inference. So the authors propose to use variational inference um, as approximate inference scheme. This is a very common practice in Bayesian neural networks uh, and the reference for this profit, um, using variational inference is given here. So just to walk you through what this um, would consist of, if we wanted to do variational inference to compute an approximate posterior on 
one of our collections of parameters. Uh, let's suppose that we wanted to compute point estimates for um, phi and theta, and we were going to compute an approximate posterior for W. So we have some observations, some data set Y, and um, this is how we're going to go about it. So unfortunately, both the posterior, the exact posterior, and the log, mar log marginal likelihood uh, involved intractable integrals, so they can't be evaluated. So doing exact inference is, is not really going to work in this case. So what variational inference does is um, it gets around this by um, saying we can compute a bound on the model evidence, on the log marginal likelihood, by um, using what's called the evidence lower bound or the elbow. Uh, so we're not going to derive this equation, but it turns out that the log marginal likelihood is bounded below by these two quantities here. So um, this expectation over some distribution Q, we'll talk about in a second, um, of the, uh, the log likelihood, not marginal likelihood, but the likelihood. So we haven't, you know, so we haven't integrated at W in this quantity. And the KL distribution between this distribution Q and the prior that we placed over this, the weight. So in this case, the spectral uh, density over the weights. And Q of W in, in this case is our approximation to our posterior. So Q of W is gonna be the thing we try and learn and when we're done, that's gonna be our approximate posterior. Um, and so the nice thing in this case, another interpretation of the elbow that sometimes happens is um, this term on the left is sometimes called a reconstruction cost. So sampling from our approximate posterior, um, how likely is their data? And to avoid overfitting, sometimes this KL term can be seen as a regularizer where we try and make sure that this Q, our, our um, approximation stays as close to as our, our prior as we can. But in this equation, we can um, select any parameterization for Q that we want. Uh, and you know, different selections will have different trade-offs. If we choose a more flexible model, then we're more likely to um, get close to our posterior and we're gonna close the gap between these two bounds, but um, there are you know, various performance trade-offs with such choice. And a common choice is actually to use a factorized Gaussian. So this lower bound can be maximized using gradient descent. So whatever parameters we choose for the distribution Q, we basically go back and we say, um, I'm gonna fit these using gradient descent to maximize the elbow. And in the case, if we actually did choose a factorized Gaussian, this has a nice um, effect, which the KL uh, can be computed analytically. And so if it can be computed analytically, its gradients can be automatically um, arrived at using automatic differentiation software, such as um, the Python libraries, PyTorch, TensorFlow. There are a few more out there, Autograd, Jax, um, Piano. Pick your favorite one and you can implement it in it. But the second component of the elbow can't be computed in closed form. So in this case, we're going to have to take a Monte Carlo approximation. So one thing that um, if you look at this equation, uh, there's a difficulty with taking on a Monte Carlo approximation with this and then maximizing it because we're actually going to be varying the parameters of the thing which we're going to be sampling from. And so that can get a bit tricky and introduced a lot of variance into this estimator. So this is me restating this. Um, since Q of W contains parameters that need to be optimized and W is sampled from Q of W, we got to be careful when we're computing these gradients. So um, a trick that was used is called the reparameterization trick. And this is a pretty common trick now in machine learning, which basically says, well, just reparameterize your samples so that um, you're no longer sampling from a distribution that's varying, but you're instead sampling from this fixed distribution, say zero one Gaussian, and now you're uh, varying the reparameterization of those samples. So we essentially write Q of W in terms of these new samples, uh, these new um, uh, values, sigma and W, uh, and uh, mu, and those are the parameters we can choose. And so what we're sampling from essentially remains fixed. 
so yeah, like I said, the ensures that randomness in the Monte Carlo approximation is fixed when computing gradients with respect to the parameters of the distribution that we're trying to learn. And yeah, so uh, this results in a lower variance unbiased estimator in the gradient of the elbow. Um, and there have been other, there's been other work in um, machine learning to look at the variance of this estimator. You know, it's a, a pretty important um, topic in, in approximate inference. Uh, and there's been, been a lot of, um, there are other methods as well, which extend the reparameterization trick to get lower variance estimators. So um, that uh, concludes the part in which we talk about constructing a cheaper approximation to Gaussian processes or deep Gaussian processes using spectral theory and in particular using random Fourier features. Uh, and so next time we're going to look at the other side of the coin. So as opposed to um, using spectral theory to uh, approximate a, a Gaussian process which has been predetermined and fixed, can we use uh, any of the tools we've got from spectral theory to actually design better kernels? So we're not necessarily going to take approximations of these kernels when we're done, but we actually wanna design better kernels for standard uh, Gaussian process use. Thanks. <laughs>